morning, everybody. It's bright and early, 11 a.m., at least on the East Coast. We've got people joining us for this event from across the planet. I'm so excited to be with you. My name is Michael Clement. I'm the principal of Architectural Resource, and it's a great honor to share with you the Passive House of Building Revolution tour of the P2 Passive House. And we have with us this morning our clients, Eric and Joanne Preissner. Thanks for Hi. joining us, you guys. And we also have with us Gary Kay, our green building colleague, who's gonna be with us through the event towards the end. I am so excited to share this with you guys. We've been preparing for this for over two weeks and we've got so much to share with you. We've got three hours worth of information to convey in an hour and a half. So it's gonna be a lot of fun. <laughs> I also wanna acknowledge people who are not with us but are a very instrumental part of this project. And that is Mike and Andrea Mahon of Adaptive Building Solutions, Chris McTaggart, our FIAS Quality Control, Quality Assurance Rater from Building Efficiency Resources. And I wanna give a special shout out and thank you to my colleague, Alexander Jackson, our project designer, who worked alongside of me to make all this happen. So welcome aboard everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. As I said, uh, Gary's gonna be joining us later in the presentation, but we want to make the introduction now. Thank you. We have people from across the country, in fact, across the planet with us on this tour. We've got folks who are registered joining us from Oregon, Ohio, Georgia, Puerto Rico, Colorado, New Hampshire, our, our colleagues from Canada, from Nova Scotia, San Francisco, California, Calgary, Brooklyn, New York, South Carolina, and Sydney, Australia. I think the person from Sydney, Australia gets the biggest shout out. I have no idea what time in the morning it is for you, but, or in the evening, but thank you so much for joining us. So we're gonna do a little housekeeping here before we get started, just so we are all on the same page. We are um, not experts at this Zoom stuff, so this is kind of new for all of us, so we're unable to provide any technical support during this event. Have that Zoom meeting link handy in the emails that we had sent you, just on the case that you might lose connectivity and you have to rejoin. If you are dropped from the event for any reason, you can come back in at any time just using that meeting ID and password. Uh, just to let you know, for continuity during the event, all attendees will be on mute and there will be no chat feature available. So it's gonna be basically us sharing information. We are finding that it's best if you can attend this webinar using a computer. We're finding that on certain mobile devices, there's somewhat of a limited opportunity to be able to see all the screens. You'll still see the presentation, but you won't be able to see all the screens. If you want more information about this project, if you go to the visiblegreenhome.com website, you can find out more information and learn more about the, the extended project team. We have a treat for you. Merely by attending, you will be receiving at the end of this event, a brochure that we've put together with special aspects of the project. So you'll have something you can keep digitally. We're, we're, I'm loving this all uh, no paper environment we're in. And then also to let you know, if you do have questions, we wanted to provide a portal for you to submit questions. And so at the end of this event, you will be directed to a Google form link and then you'll have an opportunity to submit questions. This is what you're gonna see at the end of the event. This screen is gonna show up and then you wanna hit continue. And then this is the, um, the access form that you can fill out with your name, your location, your phone number and your question because we're gonna be actually calling you back. Gary and I are gonna be taking the time to call you back individually and answer any specific questions you might have. So unlike other Zoom events or webinars you've been on, your, your connection with us doesn't end when it's over. We're gonna be answering every question you have. And if you happen to be inspired by what you hear and you'd like to have us help you with something, we'd be happy to help you with that as well. If you want to indicate that, we'll be sure to go over that when we get together. Now, we have over 100 people registered for this event. So we will answer all of your questions, but please be patient. This might take a day or two or three, but we will promise that we will get back to you. All right, so let's get started. We are right now virtually sitting in Michigan's first FIAS Plus 2015 
passive house that Eric and Joanne have given us the opportunity to come and visit. This is the north elevation of the P2 passive house. What we're so excited about with this home is it really was a blending of the architectural aesthetic of the prairie house with the energy performance aesthetic of the passive house. When our clients sat down, Eric and Joanne sat down with me at our initial meeting, they described wanting this low slung horizontal prairie style home, which is perfectly appropriate because the home is sited on a prairie here in Ann Arbor. What we used as a architectural element also solved the problem of sun control. So one of the striking features of this home is the flying sockets and the upward canted socket that allows daylight in, but the projection of the roof overhang was carefully tuned to provide the perfect amount of solar protection. You'll see that later in the presentation. At Architectural Resource, we always say every good design solves at least two problems. In this case, aesthetics and energy, the crossroads of which are the P2 passive house. And this is the certifications that this house has achieved. Inside of the Passive House Institute of the United States FIAS program, you are by virtue of being in the program also in the DOE Med Zero Ready Home program, the EPA Indoor Air Plus program, and Energy Star. And we're gonna be talking a lot more about that in this presentation. In particular, we're gonna be talking about the Indoor Air Plus component in the face of everything that we're going through right now. Here's a view from the Northeast as you approach the house. And here's a view on the opposite side of the house from the Southwest. One of the things that we are encouraging clients to do is to kind of liberate their thinking from what is quote unquote the front of the house. I don't know if you've ever talked to anyone who owns a lake house, but the front of the house is the house part that faces the water, not the street. So when you're talking about a passive house, each individual facade is doing different things. And so what becomes quote unquote front or back gets opened up for possibilities. And then here's a view of computer rendering of the interior. We're gonna actually walk you around so you can see the finished interior of this project. This is some of the data for this house, and we're going to be going over this throughout the, the event. I want to share this with you now. In uh, a brief overview, the site was 4.8 acres. The house square footage, what we call interior condition floor area, is 2,800. Unfinished in the lower level is 2,100. So a grand total of 49, call it 5,000 square feet. And we have an unfinished garage attached with roughly 1,100 square feet. And we're going to be going over the rest of this data as we go through the presentation. So now we're going to have the benefit of having both live and virtual, uh, virtual live and virtual on the computer. This is the basement level of the house. And what you'll notice is we've separated the house from the garage. So the garage is separated by this airlock. And we're going to be talking about that as we move through the presentation. From here, we move up to the main floor. Eric and Joanne are sitting right here right now. The camera's here, you're looking this way. And you can see that we have kind of a utility core here. We have a main living space here. We have the master suite located here. And then we have a home office located here. This is the airlock that separates the garage, which is not part of the passive house envelope. One of the things we're going to be discussing in this presentation is the building envelope. And the building envelope, the passive house envelope, stops at that red line. Now from here, going upstairs, this is the second floor where we have two bedrooms and a bathroom. So the house is basically four bedrooms, considering the office as a potential bedroom and the two upstairs. And we've also designed this house to allow for there to be two additional bedrooms in the lower level. So that's a brief overview. So it's a ranch with a second story and a full basement. Now, let's get into what we're up to here. There are three questions that we're gonna be covering in this presentation. The first is why? Why did Eric and Joanne, why would, he, why would you consider doing a passive house? Then we're gonna talk about what? What does that mean? What exactly is a passive house? How does, it, how does that differentiate from a standard code built house? And then lastly, how? How does this all come to be? 
how do you actually create this type of a home? So why would you want a passive house? What is a passive house? And then how do you actually create one? We're gonna start off with why. I've invited Eric and Joanne to share a little bit with us about like, why would you be so crazy as to decide to pursue passive house? So, so um, uh, we had learned a long time ago, Eric and I, that really if we wanted to make any difference at all about um, curbing the negative impact of climate change, we had to do it ourselves with our own behavior and our own purchasing choices. And so we had done all the easy stuff, right? We did recycling, we did LED lights, we did energy star appliances, but not until we had this project did we have an opportunity to do something that was that could really make a difference. And we, we really wanted to show what was possible, or we wanted to try to see what was possible. And, and the thing, um, I'm an engineer by trade and training, and the thing that really caught my eye about the passive house is that it's not, it's not just a bunch of tick boxes. Well, maybe you do this, maybe you do that, and maybe you get a green house. There's real science behind it, and there's, there's modeling, digital modeling that says, okay, we're going to use these windows and this wall style, so we're going to get this kind of performance. So that was very attractive to me. I, I like that quantitative assessment of the house of what we were doing and knowing ahead of time that we were going to make the impact that we were looking for. We wanted an efficient home. We wanted a home that was going to last a hundred years, mm -hmm. outlast us. Um, and, and we really wanted a comfortable home. Yeah. Low maintenance, um, just easy living, easy living. So we really think that, that the passive house embodied yeah. really all of those ideas. I remember when you guys sat across the table from me when we were having our first interview, <clears throat> and, and, and you, these same things came up in our, in our interview as you were looking at this as a possibility. And here we are, you're now sitting in the realization, the actual fruits of your labors. Well, thank you for sharing your whys. And I want to share with our audience some other whys that they might be considering in terms of why a passive house. So, I really love this image. When I was a young man, I was around 10 years old and we were in the middle of the space race. And this image came onto the media. And this was the first time that we had a view of the planet from space. This is when they came around on Apollo 8 on the backside of the moon and they came across and this earth rise image was shown. And I remember Lovell saying it was a grand oasis that those same astronauts we're going around the moon today, they would see a planet with 40% less ice. This is the sea ice extent at the North Pole. And this is shown in September 14th of 1984. This is when we first started using satellite imagery to track this. And what you're noticing is the extent. So every summer it melts back and then it refreezes. And so the summertime extent kind of gives us a sense of the health, if you will, of the pole. This is where it was September 18th of 2019. The other thing that's important to note is you notice that the density is also less. So not only is the extent less, but the density of the ice mass is less. We are looking at a future that has a melted ice pole in the summer. 2019 was the second warmest year on record. This is a trend that's been increasing to the point that in 2030, the projection is Glacier National Park will actually be ice free. Dr. James Hansen, a NASA climate scientist, was originally doing studies of Venus's atmosphere. And what he was looking at all of a sudden made him think about, well, how does Venus's atmosphere have any relationship to Earth's atmosphere? And what he discovered is that the carbon dioxide content for over 400,000 years in the Earth's atmosphere was roughly hovering around 280 parts per million. And then he extrapolated that the level at which we should not exceed as far as parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere is 350, hence the advent of the organization 350.org. The thing that's going on is, as we've understood planet to be up until now, that's been based on not having this magic fuel. 
where uh, this discovery of this liquid gold, black gold, is equivalent to 11 years of manual labor. We use this opportunity to make incredible advances in civilization, but in doing so, we've released incredible amounts of hydro hydrocarbon into the atmosphere. This, some historians are saying, are going to be known as the, the hydrocarbon era, or the Anthropocene, where we as a species are making an impact on the planet unseen in history. This ca carbon dioxide acceleration is what we believe is leading to this change in climate. The thing that's a little scary is I just checked the other day, <clears throat> CO2.Earth.org monitors the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere from the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii. It is now at 416, <clears throat> pardon me. The last time carbon, was, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was above 400, humans didn't exist. We weren't on the planet. The other reason why we might consider a passive house, which is particularly relevant now, is what we're discovering in terms of indoor air quality. The EPA claims that we spend 90% of our time indoors, and on occasion, our air quality inside our space is 100 times worse than that of the outdoor environment. The Journal of Allergy claims that our buildings, one third of them are toxic or deficient in ventilation. The CDC has been noting that in the last decade, our asthma population is really expanding exponentially. And we're looking to the aspects of what is going on. And what we're learning is that it's our environments are a big cause of the issues. Well, these environments are our homes where we spend 90% of our time. Where literally the saying of you are what you eat can be reconstructed into you are what you breathe. A passive house drives directly towards that and addressing that as an issue, not only in terms of energy consumption, but also in terms of the indoor environment. So there are people who have lived in a passive house who claim that the difference between living in a standard American home and a passive house is like night and day, and that they could never even imagine going back to normal. We're all kind of clamoring for normal. Consider that this is an opportunity to actually recast what's possible inside of normal. So now we've shared a few reasons why we might want to do a passive house. Let's talk a little bit more in great depth about what actually a passive house is. This is taken right from the Passive House Institute of the United States website, but basically it goes to what Eric was saying, is a quantitative evaluation of the comfort level of a home in a predictable manner. And we're gonna share with you how we've achieved what we've achieved in the different systems that we've incorporated into a passive house. There are five fundamental core principles that define what a passive house is. The first is to minimize the loss gain. As I always say, the greenest, cleanest, and cheapest energy is that energy we don't have to add to a system. If we can minimize what we're losing and gaining, we can keep a homeostatic situation inside the home and just sip on energy as opposed to gulp on energy, which is what most of our homes do. The second is creating an airtight enclosure. This is very, very important because we're learning of the great impact of convective energy movement across the building. The third is high performance <clears throat> windows and doors. We think about our enclosure, we think about our walls, but then we go and punch holes in those walls and we call them windows and doors. And that's one of the things we're gonna be talking about today. The next, is balanced ventilation with heat recovery. Imagine, if you will, a home that has 100% exhaust ventilation. There's no recirculating of air whatsoever. In the face of what we're going through currently, that has a huge impact for indoor health and quality. And then last but not least, once we do all of these things, we can then invest in mechanical systems that have very low loads. So it's not like we're bringing the big heavy pan of fossil fuel, which is basically ancient sunlight to bear, we're instead sipping on energy as we said earlier. All right, now we're gonna start the tour. 
So Eric and Joanne are sitting here. They're going to get up, grab the camera, and walk into the airlock space. Now, airlock space, as they're moving, is a very important space because as I mentioned earlier, there's a very strong distinction when you're thinking about passive house in terms of what's inside the passive house envelope. And everything on this side is inside the passive house envelope, and everything that's on this side is outside the passive house envelope. This is also important because this entry vestibule provides a, a wonderful benefit of having a tempering space that helps to keep the outside environment outside and the inside environment inside. Eric and Joanne are, work, are walking through the door and they're now looking into that airlock vestibule. They're moving over here to the far corner and then they're gonna pan the camera around the space. You know, it's so funny, everything old is new again. Airlock vestibules are nothing new. This is not necessarily rocket science in any stretch of the imagination. It's just good common sense. And in fact, a lot of passive house design is exactly that, just good common sense. By having a space that allows you to come in and temper the air exchange between the inside and the outside, you're allowing to keep that indoor environment as it is. As it turns out, and this is fortuitous, I, I like to say we planned this, we, we didn't, but an airlock space can also serve as a phenomenal space to decontaminate or clean, or if you're in a quarantine situation, it can become a terrific space as a transition space between the inside and the outside for environmental control. Now Eric and Joanne are gonna walk back into the house through the entry foyer and are gonna land right here in the corner of the great room. As they walk through, we're going to move on, and I'm going to share with you guys some really, really important concepts of this minimizing loss and gain. So inside of that, there are three rules of energy management. Conservation, utilization, and generation. We consider this to be the essential three steps to a high-performance home. And it all starts first with conservation. Conservation means losing as little energy as you can. Utilization means once you're conserving all the energy you can inside the envelope, you're gonna be using as little energy as you can. And then once that's in place, and not until, do we move to generation, where we're looking to make as much energy as we can. But the first and most important step is conservation. Conservation has to do with the idea of minimizing loss and gain. And there's two ways that we do that in the passive house approach. The first is continuous insulation, and the second is eliminating thermal bridges. We're going to talk right now about this important concept of the building envelope. What you see in red is what we in the building science industry call our third skin. We have your skin, we have your clothing, which is the second skin, and then we have the environment that we're in, which is the third skin. That is much akin to like a parka, and it separates you from the outside environment. In a passive house, in our climate zone, there are typical ranges of R value, which is resistance to energy flow across the assembly, which are shown on the screen which might be kind of amazing because they're so uniquely different from what code asks for. So here we are looking at the energy program for this house in terms of the R values. Code would ask for an R38 ceiling and an R20 wall. In this house, we're R90 ceiling and R50 wall. Code would ask for an R10 continuous insulation on the foundation wall, we are R37, and it would ask for an R10 under the slab, and we are R30. So as you can see, we're really putting a lot of rigorous attention into this concept of the building envelope. This is a section taken through the building from the actual construction documents. 
And what this dashed line is showing at the top is the level of insulation in the attic. We have a wall assembly that has continuous insulation, a foundation, and even down and into and including the slab. This becomes quite important. There are three critical areas in any home that we want to address the insulation as being continuous. And the first is what we call the heel. That is where the roof meets the wall. The second is what we call the bond, and that is where the floor meets the wall. And the third is the foundation, and that's where the slab meets the basement wall. We want to generate a continuous insulation plane that continually travels across the entire envelope, enveloping you kind of like a, a, a thermos chest in a energy efficient envelope. This is a picture of the house during construction. One of the things that we explored with this project was prefabricated building components. We had the wall assemblies built off site in a controlled environment and then had them shipped to the site. The concept is, is that building this in a controlled environment allows you to contain some of the elements that we have to run into when we're building in the environment. If you think about it, your home is one of the only things in your world that you accept gets built on site. This would be equivalent to GM backing up a pickup truck and dumping the parts in your front yard and building your vault. The idea that we're seeing in terms of the industry is moving to more and more of these high performance prefabricated programs. We're still learning. We had a learning curve on this for sure, but this is something that we're taking a look at. The next thing we're looking at in terms of the five fundamental passive building principles is eliminating thermal bridges. So what exactly is a thermal bridge? A thermal bridge is a way of energy transfer moving directly across a building envelope from inside to outside. The image you're seeing on your screen is showing the eyes of a thermal camera looking at could be your home. That corduroy you see are the stud framing elements that are at every 16 on center that allow that yellow, which is the energy coming through the building to the outside. In a passive house, we get real rigorous about eliminating those thermal bridges. And the reason we do that is because we have such a high level of R value in the walls that we could be at risk of condensation if we have a weak link. So one of the things that we'll talk a little bit more about later in the presentation is the critical importance of understanding the hydrothermal dynamic of the building envelope. Using the advanced energy modeling software that we have, we're able to dissect this and make sure that we are indeed not creating any thermal bridges. Because stuff like this is what happens when you have ideal humidity levels inside a home that has thermal bridges. Many of you might be wondering what this is. There was a piece of furniture tucked in a corner. A piece of furniture minimizes the amount of air movement. It then makes it at risk for mold. And you can start to see here, why is there this line coming up? Because that's where there's the first stud cavity, stud um, bay adjacent to that corner. So all of this stuff is part of what we're looking at in terms of reducing thermal bridging, even and including below the footings. So for many of our builder colleagues, they get a little nervous, and I understand so, in putting insulation under a footing. This is what we used on this project, which was called Dow High Load Building Solutions, which allows 60 pounds per square inch bearing capacity. This is a picture of the house during construction showing the footing sitting on top. Yes, Virginia, that's insulation and that's providing an isolation between the footing and the um, foundation pad. So Eric and Joanne are here right now, and now they're gonna walk through the house and come over and set the camera right here so that they can then show you the master suite. While they're walking, we're gonna be talking about another element of passive house that's very, very important. And that is airtight enclosure. So Eric and Joanne now have the camera in the doorway for the master suite, and they're just going to be panning it and then letting the camera rest at the far right-hand side. 
Airtight enclosure is very important. We're learning that up to 30% of our energy loss is convective energy loss. That's airborne energy that moves through your house at will 365, 24 seven. Inside the airtight enclosure, there are really two components, an air barrier and a wind tight layer. We're gonna spend a fair bit of time looking at the air barrier. Your house has a myriad of different leakage paths that you may or may not be aware of. Anyone who's ever been in the attic of their house, and if they pull the insulation back around any of the openings, they might notice that there's black, there's soot that's accumulated there. That's there for a reason. That's because that fiberglass insulation has been exactly acting as the fiberglass insulation in your furnace filter. It's been filtering out the air that's been moving through your house. It's very easy to see, very clear to see, how that actually happens. But what you're not aware of is typically a 2,500 square foot home has over a half mile of cracks, up to three square feet of holes. And that if the wind is blowing at 30 miles per hour, you can realize upwards of a 30% drop in your R value. So if you think it's not significant, think again, it's very, very important. The other thing that's important to understand is these cracks and gaps also allow moisture migration to move through the assembly. When we dial up the bell on energy performance, we also have to dial up the volume on building science because those cracks and gaps that used to be not an issue when you had all your energy moving through your building assembly, allowing that energy flux to evaporate and dry out the moisture that's accumulating, when you turn up the valve on energy performance, you've got to turn down the valve on air leakage, or you could have serious issues. The same thing is in terms of heat transfer. It's amazing how much this can cause, and what we're talking about is a continuous air barrier that goes around the entire house. I'm not sure if you can see or not in the screen, but on these, which were our construction document drawings for the P2 Passive House, we put on the construction documents a red line. And the red line is something we learned from Building Science Corporation, Joe Stebrick, is you, you take your young architect and you hand them a red pen and you tell them to trace a red line around the entire drawing. And that red line should be continuous without interruption. And so you see the red line here coming up over the light cans, dropping down here, jogging out at what we learn now is called the bond, coming down here, dropping down the inside face of the foundation, and then continuing under the slab. And the heel, the bond, and the foundation. All of these have to be part of that continuous red line. And how that detailing happens, is exactly where most passive house either pass or fail. Generating an air barrier in the plane, easy peasy. It's where materials come together is where the magic happens. I never forget in my young days as an architect, my boss said, Michael, it's where materials come together where the magic happens. Well, he was right and he's even more right now than ever. This is a picture of the lower level of the P2 passive house. And that yellow material that you're seeing tracking up the walls is our continuous air, and in this case, vapor control air. And that runs under the slab, up the walls, and then when we come up to the outside, that folds up and then is taped down to the deck. Here's another shot of this so you can see. Whoop, go back. You can see how that yellow guard is what the material is called is coming up and it's making that bridge across that gap. It's folded back to the inside. I'll go back one shot. It's folded back to the inside. And then when the walls are set in place, it's folded up and it's taped to the high performance vapor variable Intello membrane. This is on the inside of this house, but it doesn't stop there. It also continues, whoop, going backwards now. It also continues up the wall and happens at the ceiling plane as well. So the entire ceiling plane is generated as an air control layer. This is a product that we're using called zip sheathing. 
that has a coating on it that gives us the air performance that we're looking for. And the key thing is it's all at the intersections, at the junctions. And we learned a few things on this project. This is a picture of our blower door test being conducted by Chris McTaggart from Building Efficiency Resources, who was our quality control, quality assurance rater. So what's a blower door? Blower door is really rather simple. It's a way for us to depressurize the house and check to see how much leakiness is in place. How it works is fairly simple. You'll see that circle on the red big plane. That circle is a fan. It has a tight gasket that seals it to the red plane. The red plane is a fabric gasket that is pressed against the jams, the head, and the sill of the door, basically forming an airtight uh, seal. All the other doors and windows are closed. The fan is turned on, and we then depressurize the house to a 50 Pascal pressure difference. That emulates roughly a 25 mile per hour wind that's blowing at the house from all different areas. That allows us to see where exactly our air leakiness is happening. Now, if you'll notice, he has a little bit of a concerned look on his face. When we did this test, we discovered that we weren't quite at our target that we were looking at, which was 0.05 CFM 50. So what does that mean? That means we can continue to look to see where it is that we may be generating leakage paths. So what we did is we brought in a company called Aerobarrier. And what they do is they basically used an aerosolized acrylic sealant to create a fog inside the house. We have a blower door that's set up that's blowing in reverse. It's pressurizing the house. So all the air in the house is trying to escape through all those myriad of half mile cracks. When the air tries to escape, it carries the aerosolized mist with it. This aerosolized mist starts to accumulate and it can slowly start to close down gaps as deep or as, as wide as one half inch. So we were able to basically analyze this while it was going on and continue the aerosolizing mistreatment until we reached the air performance that we were looking for. And this is the rig outside that was delivering the product. We are thinking that Aero Barrier is a phenomenal solution to being able to control air control leakage in existing homes and new homes. Now, the idea is you would still go through all the steps that you were trying to do to minimize it, but this is a nice way to say, kind of top off the tank if you're looking for a higher performance in a passive house, and it can make a significant difference in any existing homes as well. So from the master bedroom, I'm going to have Joanne walk over to the nightstand and activate can you bring that button closer to we so we can see it, Joanne? Sure. All right. This is this is a magic button. Joanne's going to now push the magic button. All right. And now we're going to walk from the master bedroom around the corner to the master bath. This house has been designed with whoops, getting ahead of myself. Let me go back. This house has been designed with the idea of the bathroom being a accessible bathroom. Part of what we're helping people realize is no matter where they are in life, no matter what age they are, no matter what their aspirations are, it's good to be thinking about the fact that after you celebrate a certain number of birthdays, things may not work as well. So if we can take that into account, as we have with Eric and Joanne's home, with wider doorways, access paths, circulation distance, roll across threshold showers, we can make it a lot easier for people to stay in their house indefinitely. Now, while we're here in the bathroom, we're gonna talk about another concept in the five principal aspects of Passive House, and that's minimize mechanicals. And what we'd like to show you is if Joanne can walk over to that sink, we have installed a structured plumbing system that has a recirculating pump and wireless activation switch. So let's say Joanna had woken up from her slumbers, she reached over to the nightstand, she pushed that button, she 
rubbed the sleep out of her eyes. She made her way into the bathroom and she came over to the sink. And she has a, a thermostat, a thermometer with her. And what is the thermometer set at right now? 73.6 or 7. 73. All right, 73.4. And she's going to turn on the hot water. And we're going to let it run five seconds. One, two, three, four, five. And then go ahead and put that thermometer in. And I can't quite see from here. What's, what is the temperature reading? Right now it's at 105 and still going up. So within five seconds, it went from ambient temperature of 77 to 105. And this is part of our energy management system where we're trying to reduce the amount of energy it takes to get hot water around the home. When we turn up the dial on a passive house on our thermal envelope, all of a sudden, our heating and cooling loads plummet. What now becomes more prevalent is our domestic hot water, and in many cases, our appliances and plug loads. So the screenshot is showing you what that digital um, button looks like. And this is a diagram showing you how the circulation, recirculation system works. So what would happen is Joanne would push the button on the switch, that in turn, would activate this pump. The pump would turn on and start drawing down water on the reserve loop. That would then draw hot water out of the hot water tank. It would come and it would literally bypass all of the sinks and head back to the tank. So essentially we're delivering hot water in a circular fashion, but we're not extracting that hot water. Then when Joanne comes, and turns on the sink switch, that hot water then flows up to the sink and makes its way to her hand. And in this way, what's neat about this is not only are we reducing the amount of energy we're using, we're also reducing the amount of water we're consuming. So this is Passive House, its focus is primarily on energy and indoor environmental quality. There is water conservation as part of it, but the key thing is energy. As it turns out, there's a wonderful side uh, benefit, if you will, a bonus of also reducing the amount of water we're consuming. So Eric and Joanne standing here in the doorway of the master bath are now going to come out here and set the camera here and pan the great room so you can see this from the other view. Now, this is where I want to introduce another concept inside of the five fundamental passive building principles. And that is the concept of high performance windows and doors. And you can see that window, hold for one second on the pan, Eric, if you can. So that's, those are the windows that face the north towards the estuary that's at the back of this property. And now as Eric and Joanne pan the camera across, they're gonna land on the south wall, which is a very important part of the process of this house. So there's two things that we're looking at in terms of high performance windows and doors. The first is to optimize gains. The second is to minimize losses. Now, Eric and Joanne are shining the camera right now at something that's called a TROM wall. We're gonna spend a little time talking about that in terms of using windows and doors to optimize gains. Well, how do we optimize gains? We optimize gains through either internal or external gains. Internal gains would be you, your body heat, your pets, the, the plug loads, the lights, the appliances. The external gains are going to come to us by the sun. And what we like about the sun is it doesn't send a bill. It's my favorite type of nuclear reaction. And how this works is like this. Before we start any passive house project, and ideally, didn't happen in our case, Eric and Joanne, but ideally, before clients purchase their property, we help them select the site by doing what's called a solar analysis. And what we use is a device called the Solar Pathfinder. Solar Pathfinder is a very simple device that replicates the path of the sun in a chart and then uses a convex dome to reflect upon that chart any impediments to solar opportunity. 
So what you're seeing here, I'm gonna change the color. This is the path of the sun on the longest day of the year, on June 21. This is the path of the sun on the shortest day of the year, on December 21. What we want to try to avoid is to have any type of impediment happening on that chart anywhere between December 21 and March and September 21, when that's the solstice, I'm sorry, the equinox. What you're seeing here in terms of impediment is wonderful because it's so minimal. Here you see a little bit of tree tucking up, a little bit of tree over here. And what we look for in particular is what is going to be available between solar 9 a.m. and solar 3 p.m. And as you can see in this diagram, Eric and Joanne's site had this incredible opportunity for solar harvesting. I mean, this, this is a rural setting, but nonetheless, even though it's a rural setting, this was some of the best solar aperture we've ever seen. So we think, terrific, this is the perfect site. Or is it? Let's take a look at the site analysis. This is an aerial map showing the site. The center of attention is where they were planning on putting their house, which is right here. And what we're showing you is the solar azimuth. This is the path of the sun in the summertime and the path of the sun in the wintertime. And when you look at that, you think, man, this looks great. We have all this access to sun. Yeah, except for one thing. The preferred view was to the north. So our opportunity and challenge was how do you create a passive house where we know the preponderance of the glass is going to be facing north, which only does one thing, and that's lose energy. And our south facing wants to be a more protected view, and that's not what we want to be looking anyway. Well, here's what we do. We take advantage of the greenhouse effect, and we use something called a Trom wall. How a Trom wall works is it basically multiplies and magnifies the sun energy that's hitting the exterior surface. And then that energy is stored in the mass of the Trom wall until later on in the evening when the sun goes down and that energy is re-radiated back into the inside. This is identical to what happens when you go out to your car after it's been sitting outside in the sun for a number of hours and you open the door and you have that blast of heat coming in. That's because the wavelength of the sun radiation changes once it hits that mass surface. So what we did is we said, fine, Let's put our vision glass here to the north, and let's put our energy capturing glass here to the south by virtue of using a Trom wall. I'm gonna show you images of the Trom wall during construction. So this is a view from the outside. And what we used was eight inch thick concrete block walls and we filled the cores. The top of these walls are left open to let a little bit of a view and daylight in. And then on the inside of the walls, this is the view from the inside. So that mass wall basically comes through from the outside to the inside. On the exterior of the wall, we apply a special selective surface. This is a tin oxide surface and it has the capacity to accept all of the sun radiation and only let 5% of it re-radiate outward, the rest of it, 95%, is concentrated in the mass of the wall. This is the glazing that's been placed on the outside, and this is the finished version of this. And if Eric and Joanne, if, if, uh, if Joanne, if, if you could wander over there to the Tron wall, and maybe Eric, you can bring the camera a little closer so our, our participants can see this a little closer up. And I'd love to hear um, from Eric and Joanna, Joanne, how, how that wall is performed and, and what you talk to us about passive living in a passive house with a trauma wall. <laughs> well, it's um it is really a great feature. I mean, um the it, when it was sunny on a winter day, I would often come home from work and come over here and actually just go like this <laughs> just to see if it was working. And it, it was always it was always this really nice, warm, um radiant heat it was very nice and also I, I probably didn't notice it there's also a tram wall in the bedroom that's a much smaller space and it was always cozy warm in there which i for one really loved in the winter time so 
One of the things that's neat about a trauma, as Joanne is expressing, is the energy is line of sight transfer. So it's not actually heating the air. It's heating the objects in the room, including you. In fact, many times when you're sitting next to a, like, let's imagine these were large plate glass windows and you're sitting next to them in a standard home. What happens many times is the, you think you're feeling a draft, but what you're actually feeling is the energy flux, the energy exchange between you and that radiant surface. Everything is radiating energy at every moment of the day. So when you're in a space that's like a passive house, we have this controlled environment, there's very little radiant flux. And in this case, the radiant flux that there is, is this nice warm energy moving through. Now you might say, well, Michael, that's great, but it's, you know, it was 88 degrees last week or whatever, and you know, how's this gonna work? Well, as Eric had mentioned earlier on, this is all planned. This is a picture rendering of the house on the south wall on December 21 at solar noon. And this is a picture of the south wall on June 21 at solar noon. What you'll notice is, is that entire wall, including the Tron wall, is in complete shadow. So what we can do is we can tune the overhangs, which was a big part of the architectural expression of this home, but it was also a part of the energy management system. As we always like to say, every good design decision should solve at least two things. And in this case, it created this wonderful architectural look, kind of a prairie style that was Eric and Joanne's desire, but also was part of our energy management system. And do we, do we know it works? Well, here's a picture taken on July 9th at 1.52 p.m. And if you notice, there's the line of the sun. They, they are completely cut off from any possible impingement of solar energy. All right, now let's move from where Eric and Joanne are standing right here. We're gonna move through the house and go into the home office study. And we're gonna stop right here and have a conversation about the other aspect of high performance windows and doors. And that is, eliminating loss or minimizing loss. So we've talked about how we're optimizing gains with glass through passive means. In this case, it was a trom wall, but we can always do direct gain glass. We would use direct gain glass and we would put mass in the house, either on the floor or on the walls. In this case, we tilted that mass up and we created a trom wall. But we're also looking at how we can minimize losses. For this project, we use Zola, High Performance European Windows. And what's, what makes it a high performance window? Well, a high performance window is a multi-planed window. In Eric and Joanne's case, it's a triple pane window. It's thermally broken. And by that, what we mean is that there's a separation between the inside and the outside, so you don't have through conductivity of that thermal bridging we had talked about. The other thing is the glazing is tuned. What does that mean? There's a concept of making the glass in the orientation it's facing, dialed in to either admit sun energy or deflect sun energy. And that performance value is called solar heat gain coefficient or SHBC. And a passive house, we're able to tune, orientate, orient the windows in such a fashion so we have so high solar heat gain coefficient on the north and low on the, on, sorry, on the south and low on the north, east, and west. And then the last part, which is just about as important, is the idea of it being gasketed. Eric or Joanne, would, you, would one of you mind going ahead and, and opening up that window? So, and if, I don't know, can you bring that camera in so we can see the jam of the window? So I'm gonna have a, uh, I've got a picture on the screen which is similar to what you're seeing there. But those three red arrows are showing you the triple gasketing that is present in a high performance house window. Most domestic windows have one gasket, period. The other thing that most domestic windows don't have is the idea of this defeating the thermal bridging. If you notice, there's this insertion of insulation preventing that energy flux through the window. The other thing that's nice about these types of windows is how they operate. Eric, do you wanna show us how that works? 
Sure, Michael. So these windows have what's called a tilt turn feature. So Eric has just closed the window and activated the handle upwards, and then that opens the window to be tilted in like an awning. This allows ventilation if it might be raining outside or if you just want a little bit of ventilation or if you want security. The other way you can do this is to close the window and then open it like a door, like a casement. Isn't that cool? I just love I just love these windows. We, we do too. We, these are one of the best features of the house, really. And the, the next slide is going to show, this is, you can't quite see it, but this is that same window. And you can get a sense for the size of the window. I mean, that window is around three and a half inches thick. A passive house window is a part of the passive house envelope. And so it really wants to be thought of as a key piece. Now, you might be asking, and Eric and Joanna, you can go ahead and move the camera to the corner so we can pan the, the study. You might be asking, you know, Michael, uh, you do all this wonderful stuff in your team and your colleagues, you know, but are, are we stuck in the house? Can we not open a window? Yes, Virginia, you can open a window in a passive house. We want you to open a window, but we want you to open the window when the temperature and conditions outside are what you want on the inside. And so it's not like you can't ever open the windows, but it's like when it's in Michigan and it's like 70% of the year when you don't want to open the window, you have this nice isolation between yourself and the outside environment. So this, the, the nice thing about this space is this is Eric and Joanne's home study. Um, I'd like to say that we forecasted, but little did we know, but we're seeing a great increase in interest recently in home studies, <laughs> as people are learning the virtues of working remotely, telecommuting, and working from home. And this space happens to be set up to let them do that beautifully. And it could easily be converted into a guest room in the future. So one of the things that we're looking at here, which you can see in the upper right corner of Eric and Joanne's image, is the next concept we want to talk about inside of the five fundamental passive house principles. And that is minimized mechanicals. Do you remember the conservation, utilization, generation conversation? This is the utilization piece. Once we dial in the enclosure, we minimize our, our loss and gains, we can then take a look at using what we call minimized mechanicals. This is what we call a microload system. This is something called a mini split. And what this is, is essentially a air conditioner that can run in reverse. The picture on your screen is showing the outside unit. This is the actual outside unit at Eric and Joanne's. This is what does the magic in terms of either generating heat or generating cooling, all by either extracting heat from exterior air or depositing heat from exterior air. It's um, refrigerant science. It's nothing that's that new, but what's new is the efficiency ratios that we're able to get to these things. This is called an air source heat pump. And what we're able to do with new technology is extract heat energy into zero degree temperature and even below. This allows us, because we have such a low heat energy or cooling energy demand in the space, to capture that minimal amount of energy that's available in the environment and not have to reach back into ancient sunlight and harvest fossil fuels because sunlight is the original non-alternative energy. So by using an all-electric house and using electric systems to generate this energy, we can heat and cool this house. Now, Eric and Joanne have two types of mini splits in their house. One is a ducted, and this ducted system handles both the master suite, the master dressing area, the master closet, and the main space. In the office, which was essentially set up as a zone in itself, there's a mini split head. There's also a mini split head in the lower level, one, and then there's a ducted mini split on the second floor that delivers conditioned air to both bedrooms and the bathroom. Those are all independent zones. So Eric and Joanne, if they're spending a lot of time in the office study, 
and they're working together and they have all their computers going. By the way, we, we discovered as we were looking at the energy modeling that we have a 500 watt 24 seven daily load being contributed into the house. So as we're looking at different zoning, we want to make sure the office could have its own zone. The bottom of that unit, Eric, if you can point to the bottom of that unit. Yes, yeah, so that is on your screen, you're seeing the same exact unit and the bottom of the unit is where the air is extracted and deposited through the coils of the mini split. And what's nice about these is these things are super quiet. In fact, Eric, if you can somehow finagle to try to move the camera up close to it, the unit is running right now. So that's what it sounds like in the on position. They're super quiet, super effective, super efficient. All right, Eric, awesome. Thanks for doing that, that's great. Sure thing, Michael. All right, now, Eric and Joanne are standing right here at the mini split, and they're gonna walk back over here to the kitchen, and we're gonna talk about this aspect of the kitchen in terms of energy use and minimizing loads. So one of the key things that we think about when we're generating a high performance home is the idea of an all electric home. I referred to that earlier. Let me go into that with a little greater depth. By all electric, we're looking at a home that generates all of its heating, cooling, um, hot water, everything, ventilation, all through electricity, because electricity is our opportunity for renewable energy. One of the major pushbacks we usually get from clients as we're introducing the idea of an all electric home is the idea of a cooktop going to an electric range. Because we all know cooking with gas, right? That, you know, that's the ultimate, that's the, uh, the premier situation. Well, what we're looking at usually for a high performance home is something called an induction range. And that is what we're gonna show you right now. And Joanne, if you could head on over there to the induction range, great. So on your screen, you're seeing a close up of the range that Joanne's standing in front of. And how an induction cooktop works is rather than heating the air, the space, the pot, the food, an induction range, kind of like a microwave, actually heats the pot only. So the surface doesn't get hot, except for any kind of conductive energy that comes backwards from the pot. Much like a microwave that excites the water molecules in the food, an induction range excites the iron molecules in the cookware. And so I've seen demonstrations where people have had a roar, roaring boil of a pot on a stove and take it to the side and they can run their hand over the top of the elements because it came to boil in three minutes or less and the surface is still cool. A lot of people, in fact, 100% of our clients who've embraced induction ranges claim that it's far, far superior to anything that a gas range has ever brought to them. A gas range at its best is rated at about a 30% efficiency, that's energy into the food. An induction range, by contrast, is rated at an 80% efficiency. So from a pure mechanical efficiency standpoint, energy efficiency standpoint, it wins hands down. But Joanne, love to hear from you as to how your experience has been with this. Well, similar to what you had said when um, you said we were, I wasn't going to be able to have a, well, you didn't yeah, say right. I couldn't have a gas range, but you were pretty much leading us down that direction. I was a little bit taken aback because I, I did love cooking with gas at our previous home. And in fact, when we were in an apartment in between uh, moving into here, I had uh, an electric stove back from like the 1970s that was absolutely horrible. So coming to something like this, it has been just absolutely wonderful. I do cook a lot. I use this a lot. It, it is extremely efficient, not only in its view, but also in its operation. So, I mean, like Michael said, when you put on a pot of water to boil, it goes quickly. I made oatmeal the other day. It was done in like five minutes from scratch. This is not quickly cooking oatmeal. It's like 
regular oatmeal. So I absolutely love this. It's easy to use, it's easy to clean. So it is one of my favorite features of the home. Like Eric says, the windows. <laughs> <This is fun. laughs> Yeah, and, and I like I like the product. So, <laughs> yeah, well, what Joanna's just sharing is is pretty much equivalent to what most of our clients tell us. But there is that usual initial resistance. But yeah, it's definitely possible. So the other thing we want to talk about here is high performance ventilation for a passive house. So in a passive house, we want to be really mindful for not putting holes in the envelope. We don't want to be throwing air out that's not in somehow controlled. So what we usually would look at with a passive house is called a recirculating hood. So how this works is we have a carbon and a, and a particle filtration element in the hood that basically takes that air out and recirculates it into the space. But what happens is about within eight feet from this, Eric, if you can move the camera over to the extraction port, there is an extraction port that draws air out of the space and into the energy recovery ventilator. And we're gonna talk about more about that in a second when we go downstairs. So Eric and Joanne are standing right here. They're gonna walk through the pantry and they're gonna land right here at the mud laundry space. And we're gonna talk about this device right here, which is another key component of a passive house, is a high performance condensing clothes dryer. So if you think about it, most of our houses have a dryer that has an exhaust valve. And where is that air coming that's making up the air that's being pumped out through that exhaust vent? Well, it's coming through all that half mile cracks we talked about. Well, in a passive house, we wanna have controlled ventilation, continuous but controlled. And so what we're looking at doing is using something called a condensing clothes dryer. Where basically what we do is we, quote unquote, exhaust into the house but it condenses the moisture out, that lands in a condensate pan, and it goes through a filter. And Eric, can you show us those filters? Sure. So, you know, most dryers, the dryers we had back in our apartment and the house, they, they, this is just like, it has a, a conventional lint filter that looks like this and, you know, catches the big stuff and fills up and you clean it every time. But since you're, recirculating the air, you're condensing the exhausted air, uh, condensing the moisture out of the exhausted air and then recirculating it into the living space. This also has an extra lint filter. And you notice how coarse the first one is. You can easily see through this one. You can even see the, the specific, you know, meshing of that filter, but then, that's your first stop for the lint. And the second stop is this other lint filter, which actually has two separate sizes. You can tell the right side is a little bit more transparent than the left. This is much finer. This catches, as far as I can tell, all of the lint, Michael. We don't really see anything that's floating about in the house. You're not sweeping up lint bunnies off the floor. You empty this out after you do your laundry for the week and you're good to go for the next week. Yeah, that's that's the typical response we hear from folks because it takes a little, we recognize that we're talking about a building revolution, right? This is a lot of new concepts and things that we hadn't been thinking about. So Eric and Joanne are going to take the camera and head down the stairs and we're going to go down the stairs into the basement, into the lower level. They're going to walk to the right and set the camera up here and then do a pan across the basement space. While they're heading down there, we're gonna move the conversation into the other aspect of minimizing loss and gain. And that is the building envelope for the basement. So what we use for this system is something called ICF, insulating concrete forms. And how it basically works is the forms are put in place reinforcing steel is added and then concrete is poured into it the forms then stay in place and become the interior and exterior walls of the foundation after the concrete is set why we use this particular type of block is it allowed us to use what's called an energy insert and what this did is allow us to bias to the outside extra insulation. So most of your ICFs 
have two layers of insulation, roughly two and a quarter inches thick. And then what we did is we put in an extra layer of insulation to the outside, helping us increase our R value of the foundation wall. This is the below grade, if you will, aspect of our energy performance, minimizing loss. Now, we're gonna be walking into what's probably for me one of the most exciting spots of the house, and that is the mechanical space. And Eric and Joanne are gonna set the camera here, and we're gonna have a conversation about what literally is the heart of a passive house, the heart of the home is the mechanical systems. So when we build this super tight home, which is great, and then we shove you in there, we have to have ventilation. But what we want to have is balanced ventilation. So the air out and the air in is balanced. But we scrub off the heat of that air that's leaving, or we extract the heat of the air that's, air that's coming in. So what we're looking at is something called an energy recovery ventilator. And how this basically works is stale inside air is exhausted to the outside. It moves through what's called an enthalpy core. And before it's deposited to the outside, all the outside air that's coming in goes through that same core and the heat energy is deposited onto that. Now, let's say it's the summertime like right now, it runs basically the same, but the difference is, is we have cool air and we have hot air coming in. So the cool air that goes out picks up the heat of the incoming air that's coming in. And so you're bringing in pre-tempered, if you will, exterior ventilation air. So the basic concept is you keep the air inside at the same temperature and relative humidity, and the air outside at the same temperature and relative humidity, but you exchange those two airs. This allows you to have essentially continuous ventilation. This is the outside port where the air is exhausted and the one that comes in looks very similar. And this is the actual unit. Eric, if you can point to the Comfo font. So on your screen, the darker gray unit is the energy recovery ventilator. The lighter gray unit is something called a Comfo font. I'm sure many of you have heard of the concept of geothermal exchange. This is like a mini geothermal. What we did is we ran a ground loop in the excavation around the perimeter of the house when we were digging the basement. That allows an exchange medium for this preheat system. So in the winter time, when let's say zero degree air is coming in from the outside, the preheat system is bringing in warmed refrigerant, which then goes through a coil and preheats the air before it lands in the energy recovery ventilator. The same thing happens in the summer. When hot air is coming in from the outside, cooler refrigerants coming in, and that hot air is piped through the coils, and it is pre-cooled before it comes into the energy recovery ventilator. This is what we call the lungs of the house. And how the lungs of the house are distributed, Eric, if you can point the camera upwards, is there are main ports that come out of the energy recovery ventilator. And those then go to something called a manifold. That manifold then distributes the air, either extraction or delivery, to the different parts of the house through this white corrugated delivery and return ducting. And every space in the house has balanced ventilation. What we do is we extract from the areas of higher heat and higher contamination and higher moisture loads. So we have extraction ports in bathrooms, laundry spaces, and kitchens. And we have delivery ports to bedrooms and common living spaces. And this allows this house to have basically continuous ventilation, 100% exhaust. So as we've been looking at and thinking about, wow, what's going on with our indoor environment in the face of all the things that we're seeing, a passive house is perfectly exactly designed to address that. The other thing we're looking at that we can take a look at in the mechanical space is the minimized mechanical loads with the micro load systems. Eric, if you could take the camera over to the water heater. 
So in an all electric house, of course, we would have an all electric uh, domestic water source as well. This is something called an air source heat pump. This happens to be made by Rheem, there are others. But the idea is it extracts heat energy from the ambient air and uses that to heat the water. If you pan the camera to the right, Eric, there's also the business end of the recirculating system that Joanne had shown us upstairs. Eric is showing the camera on the recirculating pumps. And we have two different recirculating loops, basically zoned plumbing. We have a recirculating loop for the main house on the main floor and a recirculating loop for the second floor. And these are the pumps that are activated by the button that Joanne pushes when she wakes up in the morning and heads over to the bathroom. We're now going to head out of the mechanical space over to the far side of the basement and we're going to take a look at the solar inverter. So if you remember the conversation we had earlier on, conservation, utilization, generation. The very last piece, the last thing we want you to be thinking about is the generation piece. This house has a seven kilowatt system on the roof, which is generating electricity that's offsetting its use. The house has been designed to be DOE net zero ready. The roof has been designed with enough footprint that if Eric and Joanne, Joanne ever wanted to in the future, put the rest of the panels on the standing seam metal roof, they could have a house which is net zero energy, and which means that over the course of the year, their energy consumption is provided entirely by the sun. And this device, the solar inverter, allows us to change the DC power that comes in from the solar panels and convert it into AC power for the house. So now Eric and Joanne are going to head back upstairs. And while they're making the way up, I'm just revisiting that, whoop, revisiting that sun, sun, um, sun, sun pad uh, device that we were looking at. And again, while we're thinking about generation is because we did everything else we could in terms of conservation and utilization, well, we had such a great opportunity to harvest the sunlight that that lies there in waiting. They have a seven kW system that they have another system. Now, we've talked about why you might want to have a passive house. We've talked about what it is, but how actually do you create this passive house? Well, there are three components that are component that are essential for creating a successful passive house. The first is the vision. The second is the quality assurance, quality control. And the third is the implementation. These three things want to work together. The vision starts with your design. The quality control is your rater, and the implementation is the builder. This is the three-legged stool that we put in place to create these types of projects. But it all starts with the initial vision, the initial design. Our office has, everyone in our office, all of our project designers, including myself, have achieved certified passive house consultant status through the Passive House Institute of the North America. It's been based in building science. Okay, all this is why Eric was so geeked about this at the start, is it's not just like touchy-feely. Touchy-feely is okay too, but this is based on building science. And what it really looks at is having a very clear, keen understanding of the four critical layers of the envelope, the water control layer, the air control layer, the vapor control layer, and the thermal. These need to be considered in this order, by the way, or you could have some issues. And passive house is really nothing more than understanding losses and gains. You balance the losses with the gains and you do that in the most effective way possible. And how we are able to do this is through advanced energy modeling with a program that's called WUFI. I'm not gonna to try to do the German translation, but essentially it's heat and moisture transiency. And what we're able to do with this is do a realistic calculation of how the house is gonna perform, and also being looking at very carefully the different elements, their thermal performance, their, their hydro performance. So we dissect the building, all these components are entered into the energy modeling software. And then we put in climate specific data. This then gives us our results in terms of the five key 
performance metrics for passive house, and that's heating and cooling demand. That is the total heating and cooling of the home across the course of the year. The heating and cooling load, that is the peaks, the hottest and coolest day. And then something called source energy, which is different from site energy. Site energy is what energy is used on site. Source energy is the actual energy footprint it took to create that energy. Inside of the WUFI model, we're also able to do hydrothermal analysis, which is critically important to help us understand how the building is going to perform. Because we want to know that the moisture content in the building is going to be trending towards dry. And so we're able to run out five-year studies and make sure that that graph is not heading down, or heading up, pardon me, but it's heading down. So we know that we are not only providing a high-performance building in terms of energy, but a high-performance building in terms of performance. The thing that's key about the Passive House program through the Passive House Institute of the United States is it's been developed based on extensive studies and research through the US DOE, Building Science Corporation, and NREL through a program called DOPT, which is optimizing performance and cost wherever you are in the country. What's so cool about this Passive House program is it doesn't matter where you are, whether you're in Michigan or Florida or Seattle, or Santa Fe, wherever you are, there is a criteria that's been established specifically for your house because those thermal comfort is different in all these different environments. And that's one of the things that we're most excited about about this program is it gives us that performance. And if you do everything right, you walk away with a letter that says you're pre-certified. Pre-certified is great, but what's really important is how is it performing? And how it's performing is what it looks like here. So this house was modeled. And by the way, we're still um, refining these numbers. So um, these are kind of where we are right now. They're not 100% accurate. We had some issues with um, the energy company. We're not going to mention any names in uh, getting metering squared away. Um, but for what we're forecasting right now, we were modeled to have a total energy demand of 12,563 kWh per year. The actual demand with how it's actually been performing is 10,896 kWh per year, which means that we are performing better than model, which as everyone says, and as one of our current clients, Harvey, suggested to me, which I've heard before, Michael, remember, all, all energy modeling is wrong, some is useful, right? But it's a useful way to start and to kind of begin the balance of taking a look at things. I want to point out that this is also including what we didn't take into account was a 500 watt per day server load that Eric, our technical guy, <laughs> brought in. So if we took that away, we're actually performing infinitely better, almost 50% below what we were anticipating. That drives to good design and good construction. So we've taken you through a whirlwind tour of all of the primary aspects of this home in light of the five key principles of passive house construction. And of course, I get all excited about it, but what's really important is not what Michael thinks, it's what Eric and Joanne think. And so I wanted to take a second and just let them share with you all, you know, just exactly what is it like living in this passive house dream that you have. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's really great. Um, it's, we wanted a comfortable home, we got a comfortable home. The air quality is superb, um, you really, you never have any stale smells. Um, even when I cook and things do smell good, it dissipates relatively quickly. Um, it's quiet. Oh yeah, it's, and Michael mentioned the windows. Um, you know, in a typical home, in our old house, you would go past the window and you could feel it. You could feel it in the summer, you could feel it in the winter. When we walk past our windows, it feels no different than the wall. And, and something that we've really noticed, uh, Joanne mentioned it's quiet. Uh, because we have the well-managed ventilation system, we don't have the, the kind of rattle can, squirrel cage fan motor running all the time, and the ducts booming as the fan kicks on and kicks off. We, we went for a, a family gathering in, at Thanksgiving, when we wanted to do that, and uh, had a rental home. And what we noticed was just how drafty and how loud that house was, which was a, a it, it was a home in Michigan, but it was hot for, you know, gas forced air. 
And that's what we, that's what I grew up with. That's what we had at our old house. I, I thought that was natural and normal. I thought it was the best until we got this. And, and the, but the, the great thing, you know, they, they call it passive house for a reason. You don't have to do anything in the house really to get the benefit. It's done. It's passive. It's been designed mm -hmm. in. It's built in. And it works. It works very well indeed. We're extremely pleased. Yeah. Extremely pleased. And so thanks, Mike. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Alex. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> yes. So um, one of the things that if, if it's not on your mind, it's probably certainly on some of your minds or it will be. It's like, Michael, this is all great. I love it. This is wonderful. But how much does this cost, right? So what we usually tell people is to get to passive house performance, it all depends. And I'm probably, I don't know how many times I've said it all depends. There's many choices and decisions that Eric and Joanne made that made this house what it is that have nothing to do whatsoever with passive house. But what we usually tell people is somewhere on the range of 10 to 20% increase in cost is what you will typically be looking at depending on the decisions you make. But that's not necessarily the true for everything, because in some cases, as you've seen with this house, some of the core decisions that were made had nothing to do with added cost. It's just good decisions, such as fundamentally the orientation and positioning of the building, the building envelope, the geometry of the button. You know, I mean, uh, not, not to cast any aspersions to any of you who might be participating as attendees, but we're looking at very simple building forms. All those jigs and jags and the five gables to the street that we're seeing, that all has an impact. Every corner counts. And so there are many good decisions that don't cost you an added dime. The other thing that we always encourage people to think about is it's, it's an investment is what you're gonna make of it. Your return on investment is your choice. Like I oftentimes ask our clients, well, what's the return on investment on your flat screen TV? Well, I mean, you can make value judgments. Um, the idea here is you know that this is possible, that this can be achieved, and we'll make decisions working with you on what makes sense for you inside of your situation. I introduced my builder colleague, Gary Cave, at the start of this presentation. I'd like to have him join us again and share with us a few thoughts from his perspective being in the industry for some time, and then also being a strong advocate for sustainable, high-performance, green building. Gary, good to have you back. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Wow, Michael, that was, that was really inspiring. Really inspiring. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being on the call today. Uh, if you're like me, you've really had time to get very related with your home these past few months. <laughs> not only as a place to be, but actually a place of refuge. It's, it's really been an opportunity to take a look at what's really important to us. A green, healthy home, you know, saves water, reduces, you know, greenhouse emissions, cuts utility bills, but it really creates a sanctuary for the family and a better future for our planet. Now, I've been a builder for going on 40 years. And honestly, as a group, uh, we builders are very slow to innovate. In fact, we're most comfortable keep doing the things the way we've always done them. So such that what we're building today, I refer to as BNOs, brand new and obsolete homes. You know, it's crazy, but imagine going through all this and building a brand new obsolete home. It's actually really crazy. Michael, on the other hand, is really a visionary, pushing the envelope, creating homes of the future today. His experience, proven technologies, and outstanding team are focused on turning your dreams into reality, not only optimizing performance, but also controlling the cost. So don't be stopped by money, location, or time. You know, first off, money. One of the things I really appreciate about Michael is his respect for your budget. Secondly, location. You know, as we're seeing today with Zoom, you can be anywhere in the world, anywhere in the world to get started. And thirdly, time. You know, time is like so 
present right now, why this is fresh in your mind to get started. And in fact, we found planning is so the key to a successful project. And what works best is actually getting started way earlier than you can imagine, one to, one to three years before you start construction. So as we conclude, Michael has generously offering a free consultation to all of you on the call today. So at the end of the call, you know, don't rush off. There'll be a form where you can actually submit a question and an opportunity to request a free consultation with Michael. So thank you, Michael, back to you. Thank you, Gary, that was well said. And I wanna wrap this up by, by thanking everyone who's joined us on the call, but kind of represents us to the fact that what we're facing right now as a, as a planet, as a species, in all its myriad of factors, there's so much going on right now. But I really love this quote, you never want a serious crisis to go to waste. As Gary had alluded to, this is an opportunity to actually rethink building as usual, creating homes that are energy efficient to the point of being energy independent, that are generating healthy indoor air quality, that are making a smaller impact on the planet, that are really creating lifeboats for us all to live in and enjoy our lives and celebrate our families and friends. And whether it looks for you like the passive house here or just a pretty good house, there are steps that can be taken along that path. And we're thrilled to help you with that. That is my passion. That is what I was put on this planet to do. And I'm excited that we had a chance to do it for Eric and Joanne. So as we bring this to a close, I just want to remind everyone that by merely attending, you're going to be receiving a digital brochure. And at the end of this event, you'll be directed to a Google link form. It's going to look like this. You can click on continue. And then you'll go to this form. You can fill in your name. You can ask any questions you have. Gary and I are going to spend as long as it takes to answer your questions. And as Gary had indicated, if you are inspired to actually do something for yourself, I would be honored and thrilled to help you with that. And this is an opportunity to put that in place as well. And please be patient. We'll do our best to get to you as quickly as we can, but it might take several days. I also want to point out that we do have a presence on social media. Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter. And you're welcome to follow us on that. But with that, we want to bring this event to a close and say thank you all so very, very much. It's been a thrill and honor to share this project with you. And, and especially thank you to Eric and Joanne Preissner for opening up your house to the world. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye now.